I forgot what the topic was. I was like, what did I say I was going to talk about today? Um, thank you for that. And I appreciate um, everybody here. You know, um, I like I said, uh, that was a long intro. But thank you for saying that. Because I was like, oh, yeah, I did do that. I did do that. Um, so I want to take you guys on a little bit of a journey today. Um, the, so what I want to do is talk about privilege. I want to talk about privilege. What does it mean? What does it look like? How do we use what we have to help um, all folks? You know, um, and I also want to talk about institutional racism, just a light little topic, <laughs> and how it impacts treatment. You know, because at the end of the day, we are here to help anybody that needs help. And and I think until we start looking at how how we operate internally and externally, I think that when we, especially in with historically excluded communities, you know, unless we are looking at what's happening here, how we're going out there, um, I think it really does impact who we see and who we can help. So, um, just. Go with me on this. Can can I just? I want to get. Can those of you that would like to participate? I just need a line of folks. Just one line of folks, all in one little line, facing that way. Come on, Misha. I need you. Come on, Emily. Come on. We, and if you could just pu push these chairs back too. What I'm going to ask, what I'm going to ask is, um, I'm going to ask you questions, and with these questions, you're either going to take a step forward or you're going to take a step back. Okie dokies. All right. So, um, if your parents work nights and weekends to support your family, take one step back. If you can show affection for your romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. Mm. If you were embarrassed about the clothes or house you had while growing up, take one step back. If you get time off for your religious holidays, take one step forward. If you came from a supportive family environment, take one step forward. If you are able to move through the world without fear of sexual assault, take one step forward. If you took out student loans to pay for college, take one step back. If your parents told you that you could do anything you wanted, take a step forward. If you ever thought twice about calling the police when in trouble, take a step back. If someone has made an uncomfortable joke relating to race or gender and you stayed silent, take a step back. If you attended private school, take a step forward. If you studied the culture of your ancestors in elementary school, take a step forward. If you have been the only one of your race in a room, take a step back. If you went to school speaking a language other than English, take a step back. If you've ever tried to change your appearance or behavior to avoid being judged or ridiculed, take a step back. If you have ever inherited property or money, take a step forward. If you've ever been bullied or made fun of based on something you cannot change, take a step back. If you ever had to move because your family couldn't afford the rent, take a step back. If you were raised by a single parent, take a step back. If you were called names because of your race, class, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, take a step back. So I just want you to just take a look at this, right? Um, there's varying degrees of, of folk, folk. First of all, are you, were you part of this? Okay, you part of this, you part of this? How do you feel? Uh, emotional. Because it's like right in your face. How do you feel? Heavy. Right? 
Liz, how do you feel? Uh, a little bit embarrassed. Mm. Yeah? How about you? I'm hoping my hands they don't shake because you brought up a lot of things that bring back memories. So I think, um, anybody else want to say how they feel? PTSD. Right. Aware. Because I think what, what happens is, you know, we, we, we all are in these rooms with each other, these conferences with each other, you know, but we don't actually know, like, where we've been and what we've had to come through and, and what obstacles that we've had to, to endure. You know, when you look at this, you know, um, it, it really speaks to, um, to me, it's like a little microcosm of, of systemic stuff in our society. And you can just see it just by questions. So does anybody else want to say anything? Or TJ, how do you feel? I'm, I, uh, this is going to sound a little odd because we were talking before, but I felt like I was going to be further up than I was because I'm like, oh, we're going to do this. And I guess I was having a little bit of that like guilty feeling like, oh, I'm going to be further up. And then I'm like, oh, actually, so I'm surprised I'm as far back as I am, honestly. Do we have any straight men here? Straight men here? Just curious. Just one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? I did not hear what you said. Oh, I just asked if there was any straight men in here. Oh, men. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I have a comment. I thought that I think I recognize some of my privilege, but some of the stuff you brought up, actually, I've um, suppressed and not realized that it's affected me in the way that's affected me. Yeah. So. Like calling the police and not you know, hesitating to call the police is not something that you think is, you know, present, but it is. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, we can put our seats back together. So, um, so the reason why I did this again was just to talk about, um, you know, what what is privilege and uh, who has it and why does it matter? So um, I looked up the definition because I always like to have that. Um, a privilege is a special right, advantage, or immunity granted, granted or available only to a particular person or group. You know, and who has it? Me, you, them. You know, um, I also want to talk about institutional racism. Like I'm, I'm trying to bridge these things because what we what we are dealing with um, on a national le level, on a local level on a personal level are systemic and institutional issues you know that have created this dynamic that you got to see here um, and so systemic racism are policies and practices that exist throughout a whole society or organization that result in support and support a continued unfair advantage to some people and unfair or harmful treatment of others based on race. So how does this impact treatment? How does it impact historically excluded communities from receiving quality treatment? And you know, what does privilege and systemic racism have to do with me? You know, um, and, and I say this, if you grew up in America, there is no way that you haven't experienced or been harmed by the systemic issues that, that are in this country. Um, and, you know, I think we're navigating a system that, that no one else has escaped unharmed. And I feel like just, just like with drug and alcohol addiction, it impacts the entire family system. You know, when you think about family disease of alcoholism, you know, it's not just the alcoholic that's affected, it's the entire family. So if, we're, if we have been built on a system that, that chooses not to value or chooses to give people certain opportunities while others don't get it, you will be affected by it. Um, so, for me, I had to, so I have been thinking about this for a very long time because the truth of the matter is, like, people are dying. Like, people are dying. You know, people that look like me, people that look like you are dying 
every day because they can't get the care that they need. And when they walk into a treatment center, people are, 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 are looking at them and making assumptions, whether it's unconsciously or consciously, about who this person is and what do they deserve and how do I get, you know, um, do you understand? You know, so it's, so I came into this business because I wanted to help people. I wanted to give a voice to the voiceless, and I wanted to change the system, you know. Um, and and so I want to talk about, you know, for me, um, I'll keep going back to my process um, because I I hope that in doing so it'll help create a conversation or a dialogue or you know start to make some changes that I think are necessary. So. I had to get clear about what was going on in my head, right? So when I first started treatment, um, you know, again, I was literally the only one in the room, you know, or the only one in the organization. And anytime a black person would come, they'd be like, hey, Christina, can you go talk to so-and-so because they're doing this or they're, they're threatening or they're this. And it was just, you know, it was just somebody being direct, but because of the internalized stories, thoughts, they were th seen as a threat, you know. Um, or even when I first started in treatment, and and we had our we had a trans client come in, we wouldn't allow them to take their hormones, you know. Um, and and so you are so so in in that aspect, we are harming somebody that's trying to get help, you know. That is something that was really important, but we didn't know this until we started getting training and started like really looking at. How are we treating all the people that come through here? So, um, so for me, I feel like we are under attack spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, and we're, you know, it's like we're banning books, but we're not banning guns, right? We're banning the word diversity. We are, we, you know, the Supreme Court has taken away, taken away the, the Roe v. Wade. Uh, we don't need uh, affirmative action anymore because, you know, everything's fair now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's over 400 pieces of anti- legislation for LGBTQ folks and our trans folks, my sisters and brothers, are being systematically erased from being able to have their own process to be their own, and, and it just, you know, and I think um, that we have to, as a community, wake the fuck up, you know, because it's not getting any better. Voters rights, the, the whole thing, it's not getting any better. You know, and, and there are times too where, where I see all these things, ha I just cussed on, t so sorry. I'm from New York, I'm from New York. I'm really passionate, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, but I, I think that for me, I can get really overwhelmed. Like, what can I do? What does this one person, what can this one person do that can make a difference? You know, and so I had to turn inward. Um, and, I, and I also think anyone in a 12-step program will tell you that if we're not rigor rigorously honest, if we're not doing an inventory, if we're not checking ourselves, if we're not trying to make, you know, wrongs right, then we will go right back to the place where we were before. So I think in this system, we have to really look at the system and, and how we can, you know, navigate through it, you know. Um, so, you know, um, I think, and I'll say this, um, I keep going back to my notes because this is new for me, so bear with me. Um, even though we've seen the power of our voices, the power of our votes, many of us feel disenfranchised and hopeless. And anything that is a unifying concept, to get this, anything that unifies us, the system wants to destroy. So, you know, in seeing that, and I also had to get real clear too, that this system is not meant for me. It's just not meant for me. I always thought if I worked hard, if I studied, if I just followed all the rules, if I did everything that you told me to do, that I would have anything that I wanted. And it's just not true. It's not true. You know, um, have I been able to use my privilege to get to certain places? Yes. You know, um, but I, you know, sometimes I grieve about where I could have been if I had just been able to be who I am. Do you understand? I think you all can relate to that, you know. Um, and so, 
you know, um, I had to get clear about what am I really fighting? I don't want to fight anything, you know, um, but I will fight the stories that I've been told about growing up. I grew up looking at history books that had nothing but black people being slaves. There was no authors, there was no inventors, there was nothing, you know, that made me feel proud. You know, the Puerto Rican side, and I realized this after doing some work, I gravitated to my, gravitated toward my Puerto Rican side because there were roots, there was history. You know, I knew that they came from some place. I didn't know where my black folks came from. I had no idea. And so, you know, again, you know, I had to start looking at what are the stories that I have been told that have, that have created this, this dialogue in my brain that says I'm not enough, that I don't have value, that I'm not going to be able to blah, 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 you know. Um, so, so I grew up in a society that said, again, work hard, you can achieve anything, but who received land, money, aid, you know, like, do you know what I'm saying? It's like there's all these things where, where, where you, you also have states right now that are trying to rewrite history and tell you that slavery was a good fucking thing. It was not. It was not. Um, Florida, I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> you know, but so what I, what I, what I want to say is this work that we do has to start inward. You know, when I look about, when I look at the entire system, how am I going to navigate this? I, I realized that I had to start with Christina, right? You know, I had my own internal things that were happening. You know, when, when certain folks would come through the door, um, you know, I had to check my, you know, I had to check myself, like, how am I receiving this person? What, what am I thinking about? Um, you know, like, I, I distinctly remember when I started doing this anti-racist and equity training, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, there was this black woman that came in there, and she was loud, she was, you know, just really just loud, you know, and I immediately was like, you need to take it down a notch. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Because, because again, you know, I have been told and taught like you have to act a certain way or else you're not going to get over here, you know? And so these perceptions, I was like, damn, you know, even, you know, even, even going into some neighborhoods, I'm always like, do you know, it's like I really had to check my own biases. Um, and, you know, I, I, I identify as a pansexual woman, and I can't tell you even in this community, in the LGBTQ community, where where um, I have you know been been judged because I don't like this or that. You know, do you know what I'm saying? And so there's all these layers of well, she's not really gay, or she's not really, he's not really. You know, it's like you can't have a bisexual man because blah blah blah. You know, there's there's all these different things that that have have created this separation which does not help when we're treating the folks that need our treatment. Um, so, so first things first, um, when I got, when I came to Friendly House, I was like, this culture needs to change. How am I going to change the culture? So um, I met with Dr. Dr. Carolyn Coker Ross. Shout out to you. I love you so much. Um, who I heard speak a few years ago and was immediately drawn to her because she talked about epigenetics. She talked about uh, generational trauma. And she talked about anti-racism work. You know, and so I was like, okay. Come, come to our facility um, and start talking to us because in the end, at, at the end of the day, um, we have to undo, unlearn, like discover, discard, and all that kind of stuff. These stories that we've been taught, whether we even are conscious of them, you know, so that so that when the client comes into the room, we can see them for who they are and help them to the best of their ability. So I start this work. Um, <laughs> 
it was extraordinarily uncomfortable. And, you know, but I did it and I did it for, you know, it's still ongoing. For a year and a half, we've been doing this anti-racism equity work. And can I just ask for, for those of you here, how many of you have done any anti-racism and equity work? How many hours? 15. Is it for just you or for the, for your it's facility? It's just for me. It was with Resma. I, somatic abolition. I took that workshop. It was the best. It was the best. The cross-cultural competency, which I think it was like eight, nine weeks ongoing of hour, hour and a half of work. Okay. How many treatment providers do I have in here who work at facilities? How many of you have done anti-racism and equity work? Do you think that that might impact how you care for clients? You know, how many folks in here have done LGBTQ trainings? How many have done more than two hours? How many have done more than 10 hours? Do you think that, do you think that hours worth of trainings will be enough to really move the needle when you're working with populations? You know, and, and I think that is, you know, um, and I've heard this well, I'm gay, so I don't need to do the work because I understand what being gay is, and that's not that's that's like me saying I'm black, so I don't I don't need to do any anti because I'm black. No, that, that's not how this works, you know. Um, um, and so, you know, when I when I talk about um, the the work that we did, it, it had to be a part of the culture. Like this has to be, well, like we have to normalize it, you know, because every person that walks through the door has some shit that they need to work out. And, and so being able to do this kind of work um, will only, will only, you know, if you look, if you want to look at it in, you know, data driven terms or financial terms, it's like if you are able to do the work so that you're able to help the clients, you know, that will, that will increase your revenues. They'll stay longer. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's a benefit to it, you know, but also the, the biggest benefit is that somebody that actually needs the help will get it. You know, I don't know how many how many people have had LGBTQ folks come to their facility or BIPOC folks or a combination and then they leave because they, they neither see people that look like them, the clinical team doesn't represent them, or they just don't know how to help. You know, how many people have BIPOC clinicians in their in their facilities? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but I but I'm but I'm here to tell you like, you know, from the top down, diversity matters. It matters a lot. Um, and so I did this I did this work and to be honest, like there were some folks that 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 were halfway through the training that had to go because they you know, because they were not on board with um, it was undercover shit like it was it was very um i'm so glad that we did it because you get an opportunity to see who you're working with and see where you know the level of 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 education the level of comfort the level of willingness that folks are will you know are ready to do so um it was an uncomfortable process but you know um you know, Misha here uh, is is a staff member um, at Friendly House, and you know, um, I know we've had we've been able to have conversations about what what that work did. Um, and so, what I want to do is I just I want to sh I want to share with you how much time do I have, Nicole? What do I need to do? You take as much time as you want. You hit on the on button right there. On. She's old. I guess I should. Okay, on. Okay. So I just want to show you a video of I I had the our staff kind of create one so that we can, you know, discuss what it meant to do this type of work. Um, did I do it? No.
just kidding. I know. You know what? I'm going to just grab my water. Okay. <laughs> oh my god, this might work. <laughs> Once a month, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion staff-wide training. It's not just a two-hour webinar or a two-hour training that you mark box. It is literally part of our culture. We work with the Institute of Anti-Racism and Equity, and we do various trainings on implicit bias, unconscious bias, racism, discrimination, and how it all relates to us as human beings and how we treat our clients. And then we get a chance as a group to talk about what we see playing out with each other. <gasps> how dare you. What happened? Wi-Fi. I'm not touching any. Oh, Wi-Fi? Was I supposed yeah. to be? No, it's fine. I am not technically challenged. I will not admit that I'm technically challenged. Did I? Am I on the? You will be. Keep talking. Okay. Anyway, so this video is supposed to be um, showing you like all the things that we that we did and, and for the year and a half and what it does. All I gotta say before I forget is that a two hour workshop doesn't cut it. It's not okay, it's unacceptable and we need to do better. Um, it needs to be part of the culture and it needs to be ongoing. Whether it's quarterly, whether it's, you know, it, it just, it, it, it needs to be something that is built into your budget, built into your program, built into your system, you know, and the other thing that, that I think is really important too is if you are going to serve all folks, if you are going to serve historically excluded communities, your curriculum needs to reflect the unique needs that, that these folks have. Um, and, you know. Um, and also what we see play out between clients and how we. Can what, what, show what, what is that? Is it? And aware ultimately what's safe for some Yeah. I don't know why that thing is up there. For LGBTQ, um, or clients that are even working class is not Just ignore that part of the, the same way for somebody who is white and comes from privilege and, you know, is only been exposed from my to sexual communities. It arms, it gives more of a toolbox for our techs yeah. and for our facilitators to be able to handle such situations as they arise. Well, honestly, the trainings have been very eye-opening, but also really harsh. It kind of breaks the systematic racism that is happening in the world and we can do professional settings out in the open for honest discussions. I can say for myself that there's been some discoveries that I have <laughs> that I didn't even know were operating and how I approach the world. I um, learned about how I could really how I take advantage of the fact that I passed this fight. And I've learned a lot about the uh, about pronouns and how we can basically not re-traumatize our clients coming in here. It has brought such awareness to, as a 63 and a half year old woman, <laughs> to have much more of an open mind, which I thought I had. They give us as staff a place to talk about what we've experienced, um, whether it's the women of color, whether it's the, the queer people on staff, um, what they're experiencing and what they're noticing about clients. But everyone you know, who's client facing, so operations staff, tech staff, clinical staff, can interact with clients through that lens of awareness. And what that means is we can kind of step in when we notice racial microaggressions going on. And we can actively, you know, give more care to someone who's been who's experienced uh, a racist remark. Right? We can, you know, step in and intervene when we notice racial tensions or um, LGBTQ tensions coming up in the house. When you feel seen, when you feel heard, you stay. 
And when you stay, you get to find the color. And with it. Oh, you son of a biscuit feeder. You just backed up into the. Did I, what I do? <laughs> See, look at me. Did I just. Oh, that was a good part, too. Okay, hold on. Right no, now. don't, no, don't. No. Oh, come on. That was a good part. It's fine. Yeah, so, um, so that, um, turn this off. Um, so I just, you know, I, I, I want to say that this, this work, did I turn it off? Whatever. Um, this work is important, you know, and I, and I think if you do the work, what happens is there needs to, there gets to be a communication, there gets to be a connection, you know, because I think when you see me and I see you, like you have no, like you have to start looking at your belief system, right? Do you know what I'm saying? Like when you truly see me, like you, you're all the things that you have thought about, you get to rethink. And I think that is one of the, the biggest gains in doing this kind of work. Um, and so uh, the other thing that I will say is, is that you heard that I'm on all these different boards and all these different groups, you know? And, and I wanna say, again, if I'm looking at the system, the system wants to keep us separate. I've got this group over here, they're fighting for one thing. I've got this group over here, they're fighting for another. But you know what they're doing? They're fighting separately. So you're only gonna get a little bit of power. You know, and, and when you just have a little bit of power, it's very difficult to, to make incremental changes. So I, I think the other thing that we really need to start thinking about is how do we come together? Like how do we come together? How do we work together? How do we try to navigate and, and kind of reframe and, and upend this system, you know, especially in this treatment world, you know, the, this, there are so many changes that can be made, but we have to advocate for them, you know, and, and that is uncomfortable. You spoke yesterday about all the things that you've done to make those changes in, in the facility that you work at. Like, that's the, that's the key, you know, having the courage to be able to speak up and say, hey, we need this. Hey, have you guys thought about this? Hey, what you're saying is not okay. You know, I know that sometimes it gets scary to, to say what's on your mind or to speak up, but if we don't speak up, it's just gonna continue to grow and grow and grow. They're not going to stop. So we have to come together and figure out ways where we can make the most impact. And maybe it's just being able to, to have a conversation in your head and when the next person that comes to you that, that, that may not look like you or may not sound like you or may not be like you, that, that you can try to look at them as, as a human being, you know? And, or maybe it's going to your, to your boss and saying, hey, we need these trainings. You know, um, but it but it is taking steps because I can guarantee you none of this is going to stop. None of this is going to stop, and if you've seen it, it just continues to grow and grow and grow because we're starting to get stronger, and so we just have to maintain our connections to each other, our purpose, and and really try to. Um, stay as positive as we can and connected as we can. So um, I want to make sure that I, that I said, I hope that, um, I hope that I said some things that made, made sense 
you know, I just, I, I want to, I just want to leave you with, you know, the reality for, for me and, and I'm looking at my own privilege, you know, it's like my grand, my, my, my great uncle was a sharecropper. Like my great uncle was a sharecropper. My grandmother quit school in the fourth grade to pick cotton. It wasn't that long ago. Do you understand? Um, and, and so, you know, for me to be able to be in this position to be able to use my voice with the hopes that it might help somebody else um, not have the struggles or the strife or maybe get the care that they need um, I'm I'm here for for all of it you know and and I also um, just want to say that um, I think we all need to do better and I think there's little incremental things that we can do. You know, um, don't be silent. Don't act like it's not happening. And really do your best to try and make a positive impact because people's lives depend on that. So I think that's it. I think I s said enough. So. <laughs> part of the after the presentation um, this is the mic don't be scared of it raise your hand do you have any questions anybody have questions or comments for Christina I hi is this a real mic no it's just for the for the no. TV no it's not no. oh no it's for the it's for the it's a mic Oh, it's for Facebook Live. I was like, this ain't a real mic, baby. <laughs> She's like, I know what a mic um, is. <laughs> um, first of all, damn. I mean, I don't know that there's anyone else that could have gotten up and did what you just did. So I just want to honor that Thank first you. and foremost. Thank you. Um, the exercise you had everybody do, I, I felt so emotional. I also don't know why I didn't get up, you know? And I thought about that too. Um, and then I saw my best friend in the back the entire time and because I have the honor of knowing his entire story. Um, I, I mean, there's just, uh, there's so much to unpack. I wouldn't even know where to start. What I wanted to say is that for the, for the whole time I've worked in treatment, 15 years, it's a long time. I've never seen anybody try to do what you are, are doing. Never, not one person. Um, I think it's um, which is wildly sad that if you go to a, pretty much any treatment facility, you will see very few people of color working there, let alone in a position like yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, this isn't a conversation about um, women, per se, but we could also say that for the LGBTQI plus questioning community as well. Yeah. Very few people in positions of, what would we call it, power, yeah. right? Um, and you taught me that very early on when we first became friends, and it's not something that I had ever thought about, which again is something I need to look at. Yeah. Like, why aren't we thinking about that? Why isn't that a question? Like, where, where are people of color and our LGBTQ community people, you know? Yeah. Um, I will be calling you very soon to <laughs> come on over to restore. Take this mic. This is a mic for me. Just like the weight and of it. It's great. And I fucking love you. I'm going to pass. I'm New York. <laughs> I fucking love you. Thank you. I mean, we need you. Thank Damn. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, in the short time that I've been a part of this community, um, the addiction treatment community, um, the first time I met Christina, I was like aw starstruck. I was like, wow, what an impressive woman. I want to be like her when I grow up. This is what I aspire to be in this field. And recently I've gotten a little bit, um, I've got, had the opportunity to get to know you more and you're just phenomenal. Um, and um, you're, you, you bring a level of grace and fierceness 
and professionalism and combined in one that is unlike anyone else. And I just want to say thank you for being you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's like, I love her. I love her. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm, of course, I have to say you something. Got to. I got you to. Have to. Oh man, <laughs> what a powerhouse! You know, um, you know. Uh, tr I know my mic works. Trust me. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I remember we were on a trip uh, for in Dallas, and um, and I just saw how people were responding to you, and, and, and that is exactly why, you know, you show up in this authentic space and. Um, you are going to create change, and I'm so happy to be a part of that change, however that is. Um, I think it's time. It's so time. Um, uh, it's just, it's just everything's in alignment. I'm just uh, the right time to make change, and I invite you guys. You know, whether it's small at work or which have you, you know, we need to support each other and. Um, if we don't do that, like Christina said, if we do this separate, you know, the impact will be a little bit different. Um, but I appreciate you, of course. You know, I'm a fan. <laughs> and uh, any other fans? Any other fans? Oh, I love it. Yeah. Can I just say too, um, you know, for for any for anybody, I forgot to say, if you want resources for places, and 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 for those of you that do trainings, that do consulting for anti-racism, equity, and LGBTQ trainings, can you raise your hand, please? That's that's my girl right there. <laughs> so make sure, you know, it's like it's like let's let's make sure that 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 we're resourced and that we can help each other um, as, as we continue this, this journey. So, um, yeah. I just raised my hand to say I'm a fan. So I just wanted to, I think everybody has basically taken the words out of my mouth, but just thank you. Thank you for the hard work that you do. Um, I think my work is only possible through people like you just bringing awareness to the needs of this and the people that we serve because, you know, I'm part of a community too, a marginalized community where my people don't get served and the pain of that is we all carry it. Like, I think that's something to be important like as a provider of color too, like there's such a weight that we as helpers carry because we know that they're struggled. So, you know, I think it's important that not just the marginalized community educate themselves, but everybody, like everybody's a part of this process, regardless of what your skin looks like, we've all been affected. So. I'm, I'm a fan forever. <laughs> um, thank you, Christina. I'm Taylor. Um, I just had a lot of thoughts because, um, like, I want to be that person, you know, that, um, like, I grew up in Inglewood, raised by my gay father, and I, like, walk around, whether that be in the workplace or in my day-to-day, -day, and you come across people who are like, oh, you just can't you know, joke about things anymore. Or, you know, saying off-color things that should not be said, saying racist things that should not be said. And a lot of times, like, I'm just enraged inside and I do stay, stay silent and I play the whole tape through of, like, what would happen if I spoke up now and then I piss off this person and then I piss off this person and then what is my, that's my phone my career, what, what would that do to my career, you know, and being under, being, being in positions where, you know, straight men are in, pra in power and, and they feel threatened um, by anything that may, you know, that, that may, I don't know what the exact words I'm trying to say, but I think you guys understand, like, their ego. exactly. <laughs> Um, or make them feel small yeah. and you know I'm in less and less situations like that now but you know they come around the corner and I just I wanted to share that I feel that fear of not being able to say something um, for whatever repercussions well I think that is that's that's why the the cycles continue like that's why the, I think the trainings are important because the trainings you know if if everybody is avails himself to that will be able to start to check oh wow so that stuff that I've been saying is is not okay and then you know I, I mean I will go up to somebody and say hey 
I, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but when when you say things like this, that, and the other, it, it creates this feeling, or I feel this way, or it impacts me this way. Because if I'm, I'm here, I'm talking about me and how it makes me feel, instead of going, hey, you stupid so-and-so, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? It's like, don't be saying, sh you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create a di dialogue with them, you know? So, and the, and the other thing is that some people are not gonna like it, and they're gonna get pissed off, fuck them. Sorry, you know, um, I mean, I, I've, God. You ain't gotta say sorry for you. <laughs> you know, I mean, but, but I, I, I have run into that. Like, I've had death threats. I've had people tell me to go back to my own effing country. I've had all kinds of things, you know, and, and sometimes it, it hurts, you know, um, and sometimes I feel depleted. But, you know, um, I, I'll just give an example. So I had this one of, I had a, member of a board of my board, my nonprofit board, um, yell at me and ask me who the fuck did I think I was, you know, and when I went to other board members, um, they were like, well, that's just how he is, right? And, and I'm like, well, how is that right? And then this other lady said, listen, you know, you need to just squash it because we've all, we, we've all had to deal with it. We all, you know, just, just be quiet and, t but I'm like, but the, re but you being quiet is why I'm here in this situation. You know, if, if nobody says anything, then this behavior gets to continue. So at some point, you know, and you get to pick and choose, but there's different ways that you can go about saying how you feel and how, you know, and how it impacts, you know, whatever communities that, that are being talked about or whatever. But at some point, at least for me, I'm done. Like, I got my folding chair earrings on today, honey. Um, I'm done. Like, because, because until we start saying, hey, that's not okay, people are going to continue to act like that. That's just my opinion, so. It's time. Oh. Thank you. Um, and can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my name's Amos. It's very nice to meet you. That was, a, that was a privilege to get to experience that presentation. And um, I, I have so many things I want to say, but um, because I'm nervous, I'm just going to stick to um, something that, that occurred to me. Um, I want to share a couple of resources for white folks in the room um, who want to dig deeper into the work of examining your privilege. Um, a great book uh, there's a great book called White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo that I think is essential reading for anybody who's white who's looking to examine their privilege. There's also a book called White Supremacy and Me um, that's a great workbook. And there's an organization locally in Los Angeles called White People for Black Lives that provides uh, Zoom sessions and talks and dialogues and literature and information. Um, it's a community of people looking to dismantle um, white supremacy. And I wanted to share that as a resource for anybody in the room to do further work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, hello. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to t tell a little story about the treatment center I used to work in. I don't work there anymore, but not because of the following story. But um, they had a some someone ordered Chick Fil A, and they were all eating it, and you know. And I said to them at a certain point, "You understand that Chick Fil A donate money to anti LGBTQ places and so on." And, they didn't under, They don't understand. They're straight white guys. Um, not all of them, but I just very quietly suggested to them: imagine if there was an organisation that was donating money to one of the guys is Jewish. Donated was now donating money to an organisation who was actively seeking to have it outlawed that you and your wife, Miriam, your lovely wife, could adopt a child, for example. And I just went about it very, very quietly. I'm, I'm a student of nonviolent communication, so I have some skills. Um, did it stop them eating Chick-fil-A? No, it didn't. But maybe it put just a tiny little thing in their head when it was turned around to 
you like me. Like, they like me. I say, you like me. You know how good I am with children, and you, these people want to take away. I don't want to adopt kids. But um, they want to take away my rights to, a, to have the things available to me that are available to you. And they're all like, oh, yeah. I don't know why I do this voice. But <laughs> like, like, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> but it doesn't stop a meet in Chick-fil-A, and... But maybe it, maybe it just helps them to understand me in a, in, a, in a... Or somebody who might come after me. They might think, oh, remember when Clemmie used to bitch and moan about the Chick-fil-A? And then maybe they won't order it. Who knows? But um, even the people I love dearly don't have a clue because they don't experience it, you know, unless it's done to them. So, yeah. thank you. I didn't quit over that, by the way. <laughs>